you were playing Ludwig at the time? Was it a Ludwig yeah. set? Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, and it was like a like a super classic 22, 13, yeah, it was 16 a maple, kind of thing? Yeah, uh, maple or? set, and it was a three-piece set, 22-inch uh, bass drum, and uh, the super sensitive chrome snare, mm -hmm. you know, two toms rack on the floor. So you know using Zildjian cymbals. You know. Right. Yeah. Cool. Do you, do you, by chance, do you still have that drum set? Um, I do, have, or do you know where it I is? Have the, <laughs> I have the snares, oh and right. some of it I know where it is. Matter of fact, I just inquired recently because I had given, <laughs> I had given the uh, part of it to um, this artist Lee Oscar, he's a harmonica. Yeah, player. I know Lee from War. And he and he gave it to his son, and just recently um, there was a tune that we co-wrote that just was a derivative of, of a number one recent hit record mm -hmm. we, so we've been talking a lot and I asked them about it right and uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out if the drum is still if those t two drums are still around right. I have the snare drums right and some of the cymbals right. I gave Steve Jordan the hi-hat cymbals they were broke and he said, "I want them anyway." Yeah, he yeah, just yeah. uses them on records all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, well, he loves all that. I stuff. never got them back. You know, he's got he's got like yeah. you know an Al Jackson. Oh, tom, he's got everything. You know, really, Steve loves all that stuff. Yeah, Anything that's yeah. authentic, then then you know it doesn't matter what it's. Well, in. Textures are important. You know. Yeah, yeah. Like even live now, I, I use two. I use my primary snare. I got to tune one way, and then I got to use a, a piccolo. Right. A really high, tight. Right yeah, sound. yeah. You know, you put it where in the places where it belongs. And sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like Different textures, yeah. right? And you're playing DW now. I'm playing DW, Paishti, um, and uh, so it's always backline. But we have, you know, th most of the time uh, they have everything to my specs. Cool. And, yeah, but yeah. I'll come and every show I tune my I tune the drums. I don't even listen to check them out anymore. I just get there. It takes me about 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I tune top, bottom, the, the, everything, mm -hmm. and so I could. So they own it, you know. Yes. Get the yeah. textures I want. And that's yeah. important. Mm. That's, that's all it is. Is you know, this stuff is not electric. This is acoustic. Yeah, of course. So those textures got to be right for you to achieve what you want to yeah. achieve. Yeah, Adam Nussbaum calls it kit du jour. Yeah. It's like soup of the day. You know, it's kit right. of the day. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you do, you do have to just deal with it and, yeah. and get on with it. And yeah. But that must be a challenge sometimes as well, though. You, you could get there and you take one look at it and you think, oh. Oh, I've, you know, sometimes they're beat up, but. Yeah. If you tune them, mm -hmm. if you address it, at least, you know, and I, I always ask for new heads too. Yeah. So if the drums are, you know, beat up or whatever, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, sometimes a, a beat up set may sound better, but new yeah. heads are important. Yeah. And tuning them yeah. is important. Okay, all right. Yeah. Now, um, just some, jumping back to, uh, to slide for a minute, mm -hmm. um, the Stand record, mm -hmm. which was, was a huge record for you. Now, uh, there's 13 minutes of Sex Machine on there, where you really get to mm -hmm. to get to play. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that come about? Because I mean, that's quite an extended piece for a for for a tune of that period. I mean, most tunes really around. You know, yeah. if they were long tune, it ran five, six, seven minutes. Yeah. But but 13 minutes yeah. at that time was yeah, because it went around to everybody as far as taking solo. Yeah, yeah. You. Well, it, you know, then also all the other records, all the singles, especially. Of course, Sex Machine wasn't a single, no. but we t treated it the same way. I, you know, I would go, we'd lay the tracks down, um, and I would go in uh, at the end of the process of be just before mixing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, certain songs would 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 develop, sure. change even yeah, yeah. from what they what they originally were laid mm -hmm. down as. <clears throat> so I'd go in and I overdub the drums again. Right. So there was no click track in those days, no. and you know, so we just crank up the original and, and then play to a lot of times what was a new, even a new feel or right. different arrangement and put the drums down again. Nice. And then they would mix. Yeah, yeah. So, like the solo for instance was, uh, well I actually tracked the track again and did the solo, I didn't do it separately. No, no, no. So no. I performed it in real time. Right, okay, so it was yeah. a continuous piece and you just developed yeah. it as you grow. And more people ask about that song we're in as the end you know how you hear someone saying laughing and saying we blew your mind yeah <laughs> well that was sly freddie and larry right who when i was playing and i got was in the solo part and at the end where i'm slowing down i you know i'm into it like this and i have my eyes closed and you know so I'm not, and i had cans on right 
So they had snuck up behind me. <laughs> and when I hit that, they were there. And when I slowed down, I hit that last beat. And they had grabbed the cans and just, just you know, <laughs> we blew your mind. And then, I mean, people think uh, it's funny to hear what people's interpretation. Right? Yeah, yeah, because everything. you could think you could think as the listener, this is this yeah. is sly laughing at us. But it was just them yeah, it was messing actually, with me. Yeah, that's all. Oh, that's interesting. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. So yeah. it, it kind of worked. I, th I think I think the truth of the matter, they blew you. You blew their yeah, mind, yeah. and they, they had to acknowledge yeah. that. It was, yeah, we used to have fun, you know. Yeah, that was, but that was kind of. St I remember, you know, like thirteen-minute tracks were, yeah. you know. You didn't hear many. No, days. no, there weren't too many of those kicking around at that time. So, okay. Now, of course, then the last record that you did with Sly, there's a riot going on. Was mm -hmm. you know, the pinnacle of Sly, in my opinion, and I think a lot of other people's. I mean, there's the story that evidently Miles Davis got a copy of "There's a Riot Going On." Took it into his band in the studio and made them just all sit and listen to the entire record. And he went, that's what I want us to sound like. Yeah, yeah. He, Miles got into it. Uh, his uh, then wife, Betty Davis, mm -hmm. was the one who kind of turned him on to Sly and, and Jimi Hendrix. Right. Mm -hmm. Her girlfriend was, uh, in fact, I was just talking to a uh, film producer here that's doing her story. Right. Betty Davis' story, we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. Nasty girl. Yeah. <laughs> Great record. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, sorry. It was ahead of her time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but okay, no, but, but, uh, but so had this filtered back to you that, that, that Miles had, had made the band listen to, to, to the record? And yeah, I, I was aware of that. Well, we had did the uh, Newport Jazz Festival. Mm -hmm. he, he had come to that to hang to hear with the group. You know? Wow. He actually, uh, from what I understand, he had always played the Newport Right. Often, but he would show up just before his uh, set, and go to the set, and he'd be gone. Yeah, yeah, sure. He actually came out and hung out that week. Nice. And, and um, I mean, that was a that was a great that was a that was a nice con that was a good concert. I remember there was some problems with it. People had, uh, I think, you know, attacked the fence. Oh, okay. Down right. In, so it was got a little scary there for a minute, but it turned out everything was all right. And, you know, we did our show. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I heard those things. You know. Yeah, that's f well, what a compliment. Now, out of Sly and 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 kind of coming more up to date. I mean, you worked with Joe Zawinul. Yeah. Um, you worked with a whole number of people. I, I mean, how did the, the Zawinul connection? Because you toured with them. You didn't. I don't think you recorded with them, but no, you toured. Fortunately, I didn't. I, I was supposed to, but the situ how it came about was um, a good friend of mine who had moved f from New York. Uh, well, I've been in when he moved to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. His name was Doug Rauch, who was a bass player. Oh, yeah, Santana. He, well, yeah. The Voices of East Harlem used to open for Santana at one point, and Dougie was playing with them, and that's how Carlos met Dougie. Oh, okay. And then eventually, when David Brown was out of Santana, he, they asked Dougie to play bass. So right. So he became, and he moved out to San Francisco, and he was actually living with me for a while when he first came out. And um, I used him on sessions and stuff for different things. He's on Betty's record. Yeah, yeah. Along with Larry Graham. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh yeah, he's go, he used to talk about, um, he goes, um, I want to bring my friend down to jam with us. He plays, he plays it on black bass. He's Miroslav Vietos. Oh. <laughs> you know, with the weather report. Yeah. So he had brought him down a couple times and we jammed and stuff and hung out and played. And, a couple weeks later, Miroslav had asked me, because, you know, the band's going on the road, we need to, well, we get a new drummer, would you like to come out? And so I said, sure. You know, when, I, when I left the fly, mm -hmm. I took a year off. Right, right. So this was around the time I started to get the bug again. Sure, yeah, yeah. To and go out and play. And so he had asked me, and uh, I wasn't even, to tell you the truth, I wasn't familiar with the music. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had asked a few people, and they go, Weather Report? Yeah. So I went out and got the record, you know. And, and I'll tell you, it was a wonderful experience. Just yeah. all the guys, Joe and Wayne and Daum, and I had a blast with them. I nice. mean, that was a very appropriate thing to get back into and to go back out. Again. Yeah, it was yeah. challenging, and uh, I, I just used to love traveling with them and performing with them. It was totally different from what I was doing. Slide, yeah, know. very much so. But uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I really miss Joe. 
Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, I got to see him just before he had passed, about six months before he passed away. He came through San Francisco with his new, mm -hmm. you know, Weather Report band, and I went to see them at the Palace of Fine Arts. And the show it was just, it was like watching someone, uh, it was like this group had just come down and landed in a flying saucer <laughs> from some other universe, and here's what they're doing, and wow, it was just yeah. amazing. I, I, I because chills thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I heard that he doesn't like the, these drummers to play two and four. He wants them. He, the, I think the quote somebody said to me was, "He wants them to think." He told it a drummer to think like a boxer. It's like kind of jab, yeah. make some accents, but yeah. don't just sit there going two and four. No. It's like make those little. Yeah, it, it ain't about two and four. Let me tell you. Yeah, no, yeah. Not at all. Yeah. So that, that's nice. Oh, that's. Okay. I mean, and then and then what else after after that? You, you were talking earlier, you said you, you've been doing some things with Quicksilver Messenger Service. Oh uh, yeah, I did, uh, Gary Duncan had, who was one of the original founding members of Quicksilver. We had, we had a studio in San Rafael, I think this was when, during the early 90s, late 80s, mm -hmm. something like that, quite a while ago. Right. So I had, we recorded some stuff, I did some stuff with them for a while, and uh, you know, I, had, I was in the Jerry Garcia band mm -hmm. uh, for about 10 years on and off. I did right. between 74 and 84. And I did a couple of short things with uh, when when David Bowie did the uh, Diamond Dogs. Diamond Dogs, because yeah. you did the US, some of the US dates, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. some of the West Coast dates yeah. you did. Yeah. How was that? Was fun. It was wonderful. Wow. I, that was the first time I had been with a, uh, <laughs> you know, he had one of the first big live performing stage productions. Yeah, yeah. Know, with all this elaborate. Yeah smoke and mirrors <laughs> and everything but he had a great band I mean uh, Michael Garson Earl Slick and Dougie Rauch yeah. was the one that brought me into it he was playing bass David Sanborn on sax Luther Vandross sang it background I mean the <laughs> band was like oh, oh, oh. wow yeah it, dancers and the whole thing nice he was a prolific guy Wow, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's another nice little one to have on the CV, though, nonetheless. Yeah. That's fantastic. All right, so coming more up to date, okay, there's the, the, family, the, the family stone um, situation. I mean, are you going to keep going with this for this year, and then maybe uh, are there other projects lined up that you think you might? Yeah, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep performing. It's been going very well. I mean, they, they, you know, if uh, I had to ask anything, I wouldn't change if I could keep from ch changing anything. Just let it go yeah yeah it doesn't need it's, the chemistry's right it's working mm -hmm. and all we're doing is just bringing the music that we created that many years ago back on the stage again in the way it was done right with right. the energy it was done the spirit was done so which is a, a challenge but we've taken it and i'm having a blast with fantastic. it fantastic uh as far as new you know i'm involved in a jazz uh, label that i had was fortunate to get involved with and do you know some things that are different for me producing um, his uh, uh, vocals by the name of Jamie Davis who's an alumnus with the Count Basie Orchestra and we did a couple records and I ended up producing um, one of the lead trumpet player in the, and the Basie band it was Scotty Barnhart who is now taking over the band and he's he's uh, the leader of the band he's running the band and uh, the guys are back in California right now uh, uh, with Greg Field producing their first Christmas record. Oh. Johnny Mathis on it. Right, right. Uh, Legacy and a couple other names. Excellent. Singers. Uh, it's, it's exciting. You know, oh, good, good. Getting, in, uh, you know, into a, a new world for me. Yeah, know? yeah. But it's, it's great. I'm enjoying it. You're obviously very happy doing it. And yeah. That's yeah, nice. I mean, uh, you know, to be able to just continue to... Uh, involve yourself with new and different things and learn and uh, meet just great players and Fantastic. institutions. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely the Basie band, which next year is their 80th. I think that we, and we will be wow. involved in producing a, a record nice. for their 80th anniversary. Right, Longest right. running big bands. Do you, do you like the whole kind of production thing? Is that something that... that yeah, I, I enjoy it, you know. Yeah, I, 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 but I do, do you think... Th we, I've talked about this with other drummers, and I think that possibly and I could be wrong but I think one of the reasons why drummers make good producers yeah. is because we have to listen to the whole thing anyway uh, we, we, we tend to listen to the whole yeah, picture it, it, when you're um, in recording I mean if you're really gonna make a song lift and work 
you you have to get into it on the level in which a producer would produce a record yeah, and, yeah. and be, consider all the different elements and mm -hmm. things. That, so it's just kind of a, a natural thing for drummers. Right, you got a lot right. of drummers are good producers. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Roots, uh, Phil Collins. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Neralda, Michael Ward, I mean, you know, Ward, and yeah, all the hits he's made, and yeah. so you just cut, you naturally all those elements that are required in producing a, a record, and all the considerations are just natural things for drummers. You know? Right, right, excellent. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, Greg, I have to say it's been a complete pleasure spending some time with you today, and I really appreciate very, very much you getting up and dealing with jet lag and, <laughs> and, and the, the oppressive heat of London and coming and meeting us here at Ronnie's and we certainly wish you the best of luck. I'd love it here. I'm enjoying myself and it's great Fantastic. To you. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody, check out Sly Records with Greg on. Anything with Greg on, please, please check them out. And if Greg and Family Stone are coming anywhere near where you happen to live, be there to witness some legendary playing. Thank you very much. Cheers.